Our next speaker is Katharina Pantelidis, who is a PhD candidate at the Courtauld Institute, working on the influence of Russian emigre dance instructors. And she's going to be talking about balletic ba body image in 1940s New York. Please join me in welcoming Katharina. Well, thank you very much, Valerie, for the introduction. I'm delighted to be here after so many wonderful papers. And I'm going to be talking about a more pedestrian kind of glamour today and looking at uh, 1940s New York City. Now, in the 1940s in New York City, this was a very special time for ballet and fashion where they were especially intertwined because notions of an American ballet and post-armistice American womanhood were developing alongside and in response to one another. In the late 1930s and early 1940s, the international avant-garde had emigrated to New York from Europe to flee the Second World War, and the city became world cultural capital. Similarly, as the war rendered European haute couture largely inaccessible, and the traveling Russian ballet companies of the interwar period were beginning to lose their luster, American ballet and fashion were given the opportunity to develop on their own terms. During my thesis research, I encountered images like these ones here, um, where models performed modified ballet positions, wore variations on ballet costume and practice wear, and gave an impression of movement in their body posture. And yet, simultaneously, they appear modern and urbane. This paper today will examine both clothing styles and what the anthropologist Marcel Mauss has termed the techniques of the body, the ways in which, from society to society, men know how to use their bodies. These techniques, related to the modes of standing, sitting, and handling objects, formed part of the interchange between ballet and fashion. While a number of choreographers were prominent in 1940s New York, including Agnes DeMille and Jerome Robbins, I'll be focusing on George Balanchine because his style was most consonant with innovations in fashion. Unlike previous Russian emigre ballet masters, including Mikhail Fokin, who sought to imprint an ethnically Russian or Eurocentric style on American dancers, when Balanchine emigrated to America in 1933, he was eager to capitalize on what he perceived to be his new home's native features. Prior to his emigration, he fantasized about making lovely dancers of women as wonderful as the movie star and tap dancer Ginger Rogers who with her light figure, musicality, and sparky attitude embodied American notions of modernity. His collaborator, Lincoln Kirstein, similarly envisioned that the new American ballet would encompass mythic American bodily techniques because long-legged and long-necked, slim-hipped girls whose proper domain was athletics and were capable of endless acrobatic virtuosity would make expansive yet precise ballet dancers. Though they had some small, small foundation in truth, these qualities were more idealistic than universal. And from the advent of the School of American Ballet in 1934, Balanchine sought to instill them in his dancers. While Balanchine's work during the 1930s was far from homogenous, by the 1940s, a new American style was emerging based upon the principles of neoclassicism and abstraction. Neoclassicism was an updated manifestation of the Imperial Theatre in St. Petersburg's notion of precision, courtly bearing, and ease of movement. This image from Symphony in C, a work that the Russianist um, Tim Skoll has termed an, an imperial style three act ballet in miniature, featured the symmetrical ballerina centered grandeur of the classical works. However, as we can see, you've got these vertiginous leg and arm extensions, which replaced right-angled 90-degree ones, and symmetrical patterns in the choreography were, were thrillingly challenged with asymmetric groupings, it's still a feature of Balanchine's ballet today. The second principle, abstraction, was evident in the School of American Ballet students' routine adoption of black leotards by the late 1940s. As Stephanie Jordan has observed, Balanchine, like Stravinsky, belonged to a broad modernist trend, which led eventually to the extremes of abstraction, the American tradition proposed by the critic Clement Greenberg. So the art critic Greenberg advocated purity over heterogeneity in art, a quality which encompassed the willing acceptance of the limitations of the medium of the specific art. In ballet, as in Martha Graham's version of modern dance, Balanchine began to conceive of the body 
as an instrument, as the violin is an instrument, rather than a, as a figure standing in for something else. The black leotards that were commonplace in the studio in the 1940s and increasingly defined NYCB's image in the 1950s revealed and abstracted the body. The dancer Vera Zarina, who, pre, um, who periodically attended professional classes at the SAB in the 1940s, wore these black um, cotton practice leggings by the Italian-American dance wear maker Capezio, who Colleen told us about today. Now, these are relatively sturdy knitted garments with far less stretch than today's equivalents, and we can see that they, they took on the shape and the scale of her legs. These garments fitted nature, revealed the leg's shape, while the black color provided an opaque slimming effect and enabled the dancer's body to stand in relief against the pale studio walls. As more dancers of both genders adopted black-fitted um, practice wear, the garments became increasingly associated with a professionalized dancing body and, prevented, and presented a marked contrast from the motley, often ill-fitted rompers or loose short and blouse ensembles that Balanchine's dancers wore in the 1930s. Now, interestingly, as early as 1883, the movement photography pioneer Etienne Jules Marais decided to cover the naked human body with another kind of skin, a black costume or bodysuit that would blot out extraneous detail and allow him to focus on the key anatomical nodal points responsible for movement. So something a lot like a leotard. Um, Jonathan Auerbach has argued that Marais's priming of the human body so that movement was most visible, um, enabled the living body to progressively vanish, but not totally into abstraction. So this tension between the individual body and movement that Auerbach described was evident in the, in the ballet studio, where SAB dancers adopted black practice wear to simultaneously stand out and show their individual body line, but also to fit in with the group and, pre and present this slender, um, sort of dark ensemble. There was something urbane and sophisticated about the black leotard, which didn't look out of place in the city. And so if we look at Alfred Eisenstadt's 1936 photograph for Life magazine of three SAB ballet dancers in pale ballet costumes with puffed sleeves looking out from the, um, the window, we can see that they're sort of interested in the city, but they don't seem part of it. They seem almost like sugar plum fairies looking over the masses. But by comparison, Job Saunders' 1946 image of the dancer Tanakil Leclerc in a black leotard on the SAB's Madison Avenue rooftop shows her with her weight slightly forward in sort of a jazzy syncopated pose. Um, and it's sort of an attempt to integrate ballet with New York City. Here, Leclerc's ballet jazz hybrid posture reflected Balanchine's own concerns in mid-1940s ballets, such as The Four Temperaments. Whereas Gail Morris identified he let torsos bend and sag, hips, feet, and sway, in order to imbue his work with a local contemporary immediacy. However, her look, her look is also consonant with New York's emerging youth culture and beat culture, which was very sort of early, um, which was coming into being in the late 1940s. And a 1947 French Vogue article had remarked how young American girls were adept at wearing black and could appear simultaneously distinctive and ingenuous or innocent in the color. So this was a very sort of um, a trademark of young American girls from a foreign perspective. And black is an interesting color because it's a color that signifies rebellion, worldliness and sophistication, and also racial ambiguity in its links with jazz music. And it was increasingly part of the urban scene in the late 1940s. The black leotard look is evoked in Richard Avedon's 1945 winter play pants feature for Junior Bazaar, where if we look at the central figure, she's hanging from hoops and wearing a black polo top, knee-length trousers with a defined waist and black tights. Her head and back form an arch, her foot is pointed, and her left leg is slightly held back while her right leg performs a 120-degree extension. Her elastic body's absolute control in midair gives an impression of sublimated balletic discipline and the subsequent sensation of repose within this vigorous movement. Zorina had remarked how the new generation of SAB dancers in the 1940s had thin, bee-like bodies and were swifter and better trained than ever. Similarly, Avedon's composition displays the unparalleled versatility, efficiency, and exaltation of American bodies and fashions. 
As with the black practice clothes increasingly adopted by Balanchine's dancers, these basic play clothes enabled Avedon to reveal and enhance the model's movements. In his 1957 text, Mythologies, Roland Barthes observed a shift from the Greta Garbo type of iconic beauty to the Audrey Hepburn event type of beauty. Audrey Hepburn's allure was associated with qualities of immediacy and action rather than static timelessness. The photographer Lillian Bassman observed how in the context of Junior Bazaar, a magazine aimed at college-minded and clothes-minded 17 to 22-year-old women, photographers could adopt an experimental approach because the junior clothes they photographed were ephemeral, ready-to-wear garments for constantly evolving bodies and tastes. The magazine's imagery therefore encouraged readers to view the locally produced, relatively inexpensive garments as daydreams du jour, clothes to be worn, enjoyed, and replaced. The ballet influences often assisted this adolescent impression as they expressed both the youthfulness of movement and the refinement that accompanies coming of age. Mass described adolescence as the decisive moment where the subject learns the bodily techniques that they will retain for the whole of their adult lives. So the expressiveness and contained grace of ballet training provided a useful model for the promotion of teen fashions, both sartorial and bodily, as readers were supposed to look at these images and then emulate the models, both in their clothing and in their mannerisms and postures. Interestingly, a 1945 dance magazine by Milton Feher advised aspiring ballerinas to be full-time dancers and apply the good posture, rounded elbows and arched feet promoted in their two-hour lessons to their everyday movements. Feher ad, um, advocated that the principles of graceful and healthy body posture in daily activity are identical with those of classical dance. Therefore, ordinary walking in the street provided a wealth of experience in motion and balance from which to draw upon from the stage. So Feher's dissolution of the boundaries between stage and street movement was echoed in modeling manuals, which, in, which encouraged aspiring models to professionalize their walk, gestures, and body posture. Olga Malkova, director of a successful New York modeling agency and author of the 1941 manual, Wanted, Girl with Glamour, advocated that, the, like the dancer, the model should perfect the everyday things, such as sitting and standing, picking up a comb, opening your purse, drinking a glass of water, and watching yourself as you do these exercises, studying yourself in a full-length mirror. So very much the dancer like scrutiny there. Matthew Desner, another model agent, stated that modeling had something of the spirit of the dance because models could express their personalities in its graceful accentuated steps, its swirling turns and pivots, and its musical timing. And you can see some of this sort of around the new look period, around the 1940, late 1947 to 1950. You can see some of those images in Avedon's photo on the right. And so um, the association of ballet movement and dress became especially prominent in junior fashion from about 1944, even before the new look, um, because it, around 1944 or 45, the advent of narrowed shoulders, defined waistlines, circle skirts, and soft, uh, and soft fabrics demanded a gestural language that was both fluid and contained. Ballet inherently embodied these contradictory ideas. In his post-new look work for Harper's Bazaar, Avedon responded to fashion's um, pristinely feminine mood by abstracting the swan and tutu figures from um, his photographs of ballet dancers for his work on fashion. So on the left, we can see a double-page spread for American Ballet Theatre's 1949 catalogue. And this sort of encapsulates the chiffon texture of the dancers' costumes in addition to their rapid movement. In the image on the left, um, of the left image, um, a dancer, um, an anonymous dancer, appears in a blur of over outstretched white arms, nebulous long tutu, and just um, articulated illuminated point shoe. So she's literally a blur. You can just about make her out in this image. This unnamed ghost of a dancer represents an essence of white light, movement, and femininity. On the right of this image, the well-known dancer Diana Adams embodies the um, kinesthetic bearing of her chiffon dress and high, limp, ha, and high leap on point. Avedon employs a delicate touch, 
allowing the, the details of her facial features, corsage and velvet necktie um, and forward fo pointed foot to emerge. But he blends the nether side of her filmy underskirts into the background so that they almost disappear in a rush of movements. Avedon's kinesthetic focus was transposed into fashion images such as the one on the right here um, for Harper's Bazaar, where a dark haired model in Dior's pleated chiffon white dress with a scarf that floats or wraps or ties as you wish is immersed into her gown's movement. The, uh, the scarf twists around her curved left arm and releases to form a swan's head, while the gown skirts kick out um, to the right to form a swan's fluffy tail. You can just about make out the swan if you blur your eyes. Here, the model's role was to convey the idea of a swan and gesture towards becoming it as she, re as she replicated a ballet dancer's avian movements. There is also an element of play in the model's metamorphosis. Avedon, who had seen his beautiful sister Louise suffer a mental breakdown because she was treated as if there was no one inside her perfect skin, long throat, and deep brown eyes, sought to subvert visions of objectified empty beauty by showing his models goofier, sort of more animal sides. Thus, the superlatively long-limbed model did not only ex um, exhibit the swan's ethereality, but its extraordinary um, bestiality. The impression is not merely of feminine balance and poise, but of transfiguration, as gown, scarf, and movement entered into a play of appearances and identities. And so, a bit like Adams in Mid Leap, the dancer like model appears exuberant, autonomous, and motile. The idea of metamorphosis in fashion and dance also took on a personal resonance for young women in the city. So, Tanakil Leclerc experimented with identity in a series of photographs taken by her friend and fellow ta dancer, Patricia McBride, around 1945. And that's the image at the left, which is one of many. This image, which shows a loose-haired Leclerc crouching in a black leotard and holding a round mirror that reflects her face, presents a more personal perspective. The Polaroid frame, which crops Leclerc's body from the top and bottom and provides an inst intimate clo cloistered view, while the wavy abundant hair flowing down her back suggests a state of emotional abandon and perhaps even evokes John Tenniel's illustrations of Alice in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. Interestingly, Avedon adopted the figure of Alice in a 1947 issue of Junior Bazaar, where a modern version of Carroll's protagonist, you can see that on the right, undertakes a journey of self-realization through adopting new fashions. This image on the right shows a smiling Alice with her back to a Tenniel illustration of a looking glass. While Avedon's commercial in, um, imagery lacks the intimacy of McBride's, collectively, the images imply that this sense of playful self-discovery represented by an Alice figure was relevant to women's fluctuating sense of identity in the 1940s. And this was a decade when women had to adjust both to men's absence during the war and their reinvigorated presence in peacetime. So there was a lot of adjustments, almost a bit like an Alice figure, I think. Um, in Leclerc's clay, case, especially, the mirror could recall the ballet studio ritual. However, it's also a poetic device that alludes to an unseen dimension within the subject. As Sabine Melchior Bonnet has written, the mirror's mysterious symmetry leads one to believe that behind it exists an invisible counterpart superior to ordinary reality, and the dream of crossing through the mirror responds to a need for being reborn on the other side. Given the contexts of adolescence and dance training, which are intrinsic to McBride's image of Leclerc, the mirror arguably functions as a channel of metamorphosis or as a vision of a future self. Its close-up view presents aspects of the dancer that are expressive and reflective and even transgress the American ideals that we saw earlier of unemotive technique and athleticism. Though McBride's photograph in itself insufficiently explains the young dancer's self-image, it implies that some aspects of embodied identity were explored through fantasy in a girlish coterie atmosphere. And I feel like McBride and Leclerc's dynamic mirrored that of Bassman, Lillian Bassman and her models. And Lillian Bassman would bond with her models as friends and they'd discuss their personal experiences rather than engaging in the sort of camera seduction of photographic sittings dominated by male photographers. I mean, to conclude, the dance critic John Martin wrote that the 1940s American dancer, unlike her Russian peers, 
had no sense of having inherited some sort of special tradition or caste, but it concentrated instead on dancing well in her awareness that no assured career awaits her and that she is nobody in particular unless she makes herself somebody. This meant that she had to seem an authentic dancer in how she moved and styled her body because it was through the refinement of these material traits that she could appear professional. In the post-war years, when New York was beginning to replace Paris as the world cultural capital, American girls and women similarly felt the pressure to make themselves into someone. When it came to their bodies, the, em the emerging ballet scene provided a model of old world refinement with American vitality. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. I have a question about the leotards. And I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit more about the um, history of leotards and perhaps also about um, the kind of different rehearsal clothes that dancers wore in the 30s, 40s, and 50s? OK. Um, well, leotards actually began from acrobats' costumes in the circus, sort of in the late 19th century, early 20th century. But um, I think to begin with, I mean, dancers in the late 19th century wore simplified versions of the performance costumes in the ballet studio. But then as sort of time went on from the 1910s to 20s, you see this being replaced with a practice tunic, a little bit like what Isadora Duncan wore. And this was generally like a sheath. I mean, these, this varied from studio to studio, so you can't generalize too much, but it was a sheath with little practice panties to sort of preserve modesty. And um, you also get wonderful instructions from the 1920s on how to make your own practice garment, sometimes using a bed sheet and cutting a hole from the head and draping it around you like a nymph. Um, but in the 1930s, um, what's interesting about the early SAB photos is you see a sort of whole row of girls all wearing sort of these different, a lot of them favored patterns, like patterned tunics, some shorter, some longer. Um, and you see this like, idea of variety. And then by the 1940s, you're getting more of this notion of streamlined black leotards and tights. And black very much becomes the professional color for dancers. It's supposed to be less distracting than the sort of gaudier prints. Okay. Anyone else? 